Hello and welcome to our next episode on victimology. And this week we're going to be discussing victims of violence by lovers, domestic violence. Um, domestic violence affects every single person. Uh, nobody is immune. Uh, it is found in all stratus, in all economic levels, all social levels. Uh, whether you're rich, you're poor, whether you are um, male or female, whether you're heterosexual or homosexual, uh, whether you're you know, straight or LGBTQ, uh, domestic violence is a dangerous, dangerous thing. Uh, it's also known as intimate, intimate violence, uh, intimate partner violence. Okay. Uh, so each and every one of us, I'm going to paraphrase Garcia from Criminal Minds, and each and every one of us are on our own specific journey. Each of us is on our own specific adventure. We encounter all kinds of challenges and choices, and we make on that adventure, on that journey. Um, and these decisions and these choices that we make will shape us as individuals as we go. These choices will stretch us, test us, push us to our limits, and our adventure will make us stronger than we ever know we could be. Um, and domestic violence is one of those things that test us. They, they make us stronger. Although you really don't need this kind of test in your life. Um, it would be hoped that we would be strong enough to uh, overcome it. Uh, so domestic violence is the physical, sexual, economic, psychological, mental abuse directed towards a spouse, a partner, a lover, a family member within the household. Uh, we, this chapter, as opposed to the children that we talked about last week and the week before, this week we're going to focus just on lovers and between lovers. Um, there is violence between male and female, between, you know, male victimizing female, female victimizing male, uh, and any other combination thereof that you want to put into that of uh, the two biological genders we don't find we don't find it exclusive um, everybody you know to a point there is some form of domestic violence popular emphasis on domestic violence there's been two main reforms uh, within Americas. The first came in the 1800s uh, and then the second in the 1970s, 60s and 70s during the feminist movement. Um, but, you know, this has been a taboo subject, a taboo topic uh, throughout the history of this country. But domestic violence or intimate partner violence has existed uh, since the foundation of our country, um, since the Puritans landed in Massachusetts in the uh, Plymouth colony of Plymouth, Massachusetts, and the Massachusetts Bay uh, colony, there were laws written in the books forbidding verbal and physical and sexual abuse between family members. So this is not something that's just started. This isn't something that's just recent. It's been existence in the United States since 1619, um, 1629. 1620 is when the Mayflower Compact was established, was in 1620, 1621. Because um, I think we finally hit 400 years this year, 400 years. Um, 
Okay, so we we finally hit four hundred years, um, as a as a settlement, as an expansion of European colonialism, uh, and since then we've had these rules. Um, it was punishable by fine uh, or by public whipping uh, back in the 1600s. Uh, if you were caught verbally or physically or sexually abusing a family member uh, back during the Puritan days, you would you were fined or you could be strapped up to the whipping post and you could be whipped yourself. Um, an eye for an eye, a stripe for a stripe, a tooth for tooth. This is something that they believed in. In uh, colonial America, especially the religious colonial America. Um, if the husband was beaten by the wife, that particular punishment was determined by the judge. And the judge could say, well, you deserved it because you're a mean son of a gun. Uh, and she was just defending herself. Incest is another issue. And incest, uh, we've, you know, we talked about incest a couple of weeks ago. Uh, but incest is about sexual relations between a parent and their child. Uh, and the rule back then, and up until the um, seven, 1972, uh, incest was punishable by death. Uh, in colonial America, it was punishable by hanging. Uh, but we have a historical trend that dates back to the Middle Ages at the Black's Book of Law. And that was called the Rule of Thumb. Uh, and there was this philosophy, this idea that God governed or governed or ruled the states. The states supervised the family. The father was the head of household. And sometimes it was necessary to for the head of household to dis discipline those people that were living in the household and that included the wife so the rule of thumb was you could switch or you could punish you could strike your wife um, as long as the the switch wasn't as big as your thumb and that's pretty much a i don't know if that's a myth or how that came across but uh, you can make comments about that below. But the rule of thumb was believed that discipline was sometimes required. Uh, and if that discipline was justified by the courts, it was accepted and there was no punishment. If you were just a mean drunk and you beat your wife when you came home, you know, then you were, you were going to be punished for it. Uh, but in the 1700s, the whipping post was taken away and it was declared um, well, in the early 1800s the whipping post was declared cruel and unusual punishment a violation of the eighth amendment so we knew that was after 1791 um, that the whipping post was taken away but again we had two sections two eras of reform like I said, the first was in the late 1800s, post 1865. Uh, and there was a fear of the stranger. There was the fear of immigrants, the fear of drifters, the fear of the dangerous classes within our society. And in an attempt uh, to, you know, there were thoughts about government having the responsibility to enforce morality okay uh the, in the late 1800s this was the first time we saw that the government was responsible or there was theories there was ideas there was discussion that the government was responsible for morality and enforcing morality upon the individuals uh, and this came about with the temperance movement you know not only was the temperance movement about stopping drinking but the idea was that drinking created laziness uh, to where the drunkard would stay at the bar all day drinking his life savings away and then go home and beat his wife uh, and abuse his wife. Uh, these activists 
want contended that fines and jail was not a sufficient deterrent to deter drunks from going home and beating and abusing their their wives or their lovers. Uh, so they wanted the restoration of the whipping post. Um, this came to a climax uh, with prohibition, uh, with the amendment making alcohol in the United States illegal. Um, you know, I, I don't, I've never really thought about the links between domestic violence and prohibition uh, because the thoughts, the ideas was, you know, alcohol made you lazy, you didn't want to work, all you want to do is drink, and then you'd go home and the wife would nag and you'd beat the crap out of her because she you know, was nagging about paying the bills, about you know, paying the mortgage, about getting food and providing food for the children or whatever. Uh, so the dad, the husband, the, the male figure head uh, would lash out in anger because, again, he was drunk. It's probably something that he wouldn't do if he was sober, or at least that's the idea. Well, prohibition came and it went. Uh, and the women stayed barefoot pregnant in the kitchen uh, again, where they were kept or put until the 1970s, 60s and 70s. In the 1960s and 70s, we found the Women's Liberation Movement or the National Association of Women. Uh, and these groups uh, symbolized, identified, wife beating or the rule of thumb the wife beating as oppression and that women were oppressed within the nuclear family structure um, and they believed that because the criminal justice system was run by men uh, that this oppression became institutionalized and systemic. Um, and this was an argument that I guess it won the day in the 1960s and 70s. Um, or the argument won the day. It was you know, linked to the conflict theory. Uh, and it was linked to critical conflict theory. Um, so, we had the new rules. We had the new ideas of a wife being. Okay. So, but, you know, domestic violence uh, and wife beating takes in many forms. And it's physical violence, sexual abuse, emotional abuse, intimidation, economic deprivation. Threats of violence, stress, verbal uh, insults, uh, and then controlling and not letting her uh, be herself, uh, let her grow emotionally and physically and, and intellectually. Again, we're going to find our maximalists and our minimalists in this argument where the maximalists will say that domestic violence and intimate partner violence within the United States is a lot worse than we find because most women, they're controlled. They are insulted. They're emotionally destroyed so that they actually believe that they deserve what's happening to them. So, or they're afraid that it's not going to be resolved or nothing's going to happen about it because, you know, the cops are men too and they're not going to believe this particular form of abuse. Uh, so, there are a lot of, you know, this violence, this cycle of violence is just that. It's a cycle of violence. The cycle of violence starts with 
expectations and nagging and complaining and you know you need to do this you need to do this you need to do this uh, and this nagging is going to evolve into warning signs and these warning signs need to be seen they need to be recognized they not only need to be recognized by the victim of domestic violence but they also need to be recognized by those people who are surrounding them okay so their friends their neighbors they need to be able to recognize the warning signs that there's something wrong so that they can be willing to step up uh, to help the situation but some of these warning signs are yelling uh, insulting in public this nagging that normally has been going on behind closed doors now ventures out into the public so other people hear about it and other people see it and they witness the control. Uh, you don't hear from your friends in a while. And if you've got a friend who's in a relationship, uh, and I've, I've had a few of these friends, uh, especially working for Child Protective Services, which is really weird to me, because working for Child Protective Services, we are all trained on this violence, on these warning signs that, that send up red flags. Um, and you know, so I had this colleague, I guess we'll call her, uh, she got married, uh, and then she no longer hung out in our offices. She no longer texted other people on the team after hours. She never, you know, where she would go out to eat, she'd go out to dinner, she'd go to lunches with uh, other members of the team. She withdrew from all of that. She was still working, but she withdrew from all of her friendships. She withdrew from all of her connections that she had at work. And when somebody approached her, she goes, well, I'm just newly married and I need to devote as much time as I can uh, and attention that I can to my husband. Okay, you're at work. You're having lunch with coworkers so we can discuss work. Um, we don't just have, we're not going out on dates. We're having working lunches. We can discuss our cases. We can discuss the things that, that we're experiencing so that we can get ideas. She goes, well, no, my husband don't want me doing that because, you know, this is, you know, this is our honeymoon period and it's important that we only associate with each other outside of work. I go, well, this isn't outside of work. Well, this is lunchtime. You see how it works? These are some of the warning signs that are going on. So warning signs are going to pop into and eventually they're going to jump into violence where the anger, where he's destruct, destroying property and private property destruction. And, you know, he's kicking the dog and you know, strangling the cat, throwing the cat across the room or smashing those important things that you want and that you like eventually that kind of violence is not going to be good enough and he's going to strike out and he's going to hit his intimate partner with violence and then afterwards he's going to feel remorseful and he's going to apologize he's going to promise that it'll never happen again and he's going to um you know tell her that he feels sorry and, and that and he's going to find some way to excuse it. He's going to say, well, I'm stressed at work. You know, I've got 65 cases in my CPS caseload. I've got 65 cases and they're all on my back. And my boss is a jerk. And, you know, I get no respect for anything that I'm doing or no appreciation for what I'm doing. And, and I'm sorry, you know. I lashed out at you. I do apologize. And I hit you. And I didn't mean to. I'm sorry. So she buys all of this apologies and forgives him and sends him, you know. And he starts getting hearts and flowers and roses and candies and jewelry and all of this stuff to you know, make up for, for what he's done. 
And then as time goes by, it goes back to the same old stuff. He starts nagging. He starts complaining. He starts controlling. He starts dictating what she, what the intimate partner is supposed to be doing. And it goes around in this cycle over and over and over again. Uh, statistics and studies show uh, that this cycle of violence will repeat itself six times on the average of six times. And I'm not saying that this is every case, every time, but statistics show that these last, these cycles go around six times. And at the end of the sixth time, one of two things happens, one of three things happen. She escapes for good because in these cycles, she's going to escape, she's gonna leave, she's gonna kick him out. She's gonna do all of these things because you know, that's what she wants to do, and but she has no support. She has no uh, circle that she can depend on to help her through this time. So she goes back because she thinks she has nothing else. She goes back because she thinks she has nothing else, and uh, it becomes a repetition. So studies and research shows that after six times, after six attempts of this cycle going around and around and around in an attempt to make him a better person, one of three things happen. She escapes for good. She finds the help that she needs to escape for good. He kills her or she kills him. These are the three results after the six times of going around and around and around. Uh, it is important that we as practitioners, as friends, as children, um, as parents, that we help enable the victims who feel trapped to escape. Uh, it's, you know, we've set up shelters. Uh, there's the Hope House. There's um, in Abilene, there's the NOAA project. Uh, there's all kinds of places uh, that victims of abuse can go so that they can so that they can escape, they can reestablish their lives. And it's a place of refuge. So in 1974, the feminist movement uh, in England started these, places of refuge, um, first in St. Paul, Minneapolis, Minnesota, and the Twin Cities, um, and then they moved around the world. And just about every town that has a population of 70,000 or better, uh, or even Big Spring, Big Spring has 35,000 people, and it has a shelter. It has a place for the victims of domestic abuse uh, to go to. They provide transportation and clothing. They help them with job skills. They help these women with resume writing and uh, help them with rent and getting into their own place. Uh, they help them obtain protective orders of protection and protective orders. Uh, they help them file for divorce and fight for sole custody of their children. Uh, these battered women syndromes, uh, these battered women shelters, uh, are, are intended to do a lot of help and a lot of good uh, to help um, move, move things along and move things through. Uh, So, you know, victims of domestic violence face a lot of special problems, uh, primarily just reestablishing their credit, reestablishing a work history, reestablishing a lot of things that were destroyed while they were in this relationship. Uh, the most obvious special problem is that intimate partners are exposed to constant danger. So they're constantly in fear and there's a level of paranoia that is established and is created that needs to be addressed, uh, followed by emotional and financial 
dependence upon the abuser, then they have to, we have to, as people trying to empower these victims, we need to be able to provide them with food and shelter and clothing. Uh, and file with the law and encourage the victim to chase or pursue criminal legal action against their abusers uh, to the fullest extent of the law. Okay, researchers are investigating controversial contentions that injured parties did something provocative that incited the violence. And again, this is going back to the maximalist and the minimalists. Uh, this debate, this argument between maximalist, maximalist and minimalists um, is something that's going to, we're going to find it throughout the rest of this, this series on, on victimization. Um, they found that injured parties did something provocative, like I said. Uh, low income families are troubled at a higher degree than higher income couples. The research shows uh, that the degree of suffering couldn't be too serious because many victims don't try to leave that abusive relationship. And that's something that I've discussed in my other classes, like the, like the profiling class. In my profiling class, I asked this question. I guess I'll ask you this as well. Uh, with a raise of hands, if your intimate partner was to abuse you, was to hit you and strike you, uh, would you leave? You know, raise your hand if you would leave. Yeah, I bet you every single one of you raised your hand. And, and I get students, in, you know, and students in the profiling class also turn around and they raise their hands. Say, yeah, I would never tolerate that. I would never put up with this form of abuse. I would be gone. But studies show, studies show that there's more often, more often there is abuse found outside of outside of the bonds of marriage and matrimony. Uh, so year to year, uh, we find you know, about almost 1,300 women, almost 500 men are killed uh, year to year uh, by their intimate partner. If there's a gun involved, death is a result at 12 times more often. Or, you know, when there's a gun, you're 12 times more likely to be killed by your intimate partner. Domestic violence exists at all socioeconomic levels, all races, religions, ethnic groups, although it is twice as likely to be found in disadvantaged communities. Uh, and You know, back to the maximalist argument, you know, it's twice as likely to be found there because the poor are twice as likely to report it. Uh, the, the wealthy and those people at the higher levels of the socioeconomic status level aren't going to report domestic violence as much because they don't want to lose the socioeconomic status that they're at or that they're in. Uh, well to do neighborhoods are more likely to hide or to deny abuse, uh, come up with better excuses like, oh, I bumped into a door, or I bumped into a cabinet, or I fell down the stairs. You know, how'd you fall down the stairs? Did he push you? Domestic violence makes up 20% of all violent crimes. So one in five violent crimes in this country uh, surround or, or are uh, domestic violence. Domestic violence is a factor in 44% of all female suicides. We find that in an attempt to escape, an attempt to get out of the way, get out of this cycle of violence, a lot of women will just kill themselves. Again, like I said a little bit ago, domestic violence is more prevalent in relationships where wedding vows have not been exchanged. Uh, there is some research that shows that domestic violence and date rape uh, are at higher levels at high school and within high school relationships than we find within marriage relationships or, or where marriage vows have been exchanged. 
15% of all domestic violence occurs against men. Men are less likely to report domestic violence because of the involvement uh, or the stigma of you know, having to admit that you got beat up by a girl. But some girls are mean and ferocious and they are um, absolutely vicious uh, when it comes to uh, beating up their loved intimate partners. So, um, the government has gone and, and gone and tried to do things. Um, reliable statistics about the incidence of uh, the prevalence of being beaten by a lover is lacking because, you know, back to the min maximalist and minimalist argument. Uh, the maximalist is going to say that they're not reporting and that it's underreported um, because. You know, women are afraid to report the violence that goes on in their household. Uh, the minimalist is going to turn around and they're going to say that, you know, there's no statistics, there's no data, there's nothing that supports this argument. So it doesn't exist. Um, if it's not on paper, it's not in writing, and there is no data, it doesn't exist. And that's going to be the minimalist argument. And this the argument, like, well, you know, you're going to find it everywhere. Uh, the debate has become politicized. Uh, so much is at stake. Uh, relationships between the sexes and courtship practices, ideas about romance and marriage, uh, the views about the proper role of government, government intervention. Should governments interfere with family? Should government interfere with uh, morality? And should government be dictating what is moral and what is immoral? And should people be punished or sanctioned because of immoral behaviors and activities that they make or that they decide to do? Special problems always require special solutions. You know, an attempt to reduce intimate partner relationship. Uh, Shelters have been a set up across the country. Uh, places of refuge for women and children to go so that they can reestablish their lives have all been put together. Uh, primary and secondary prevention programs are intended to head off outbreaks of violence between intimates uh, and you know, on the community level as well as on the interpersonal level. One of the things that we did and I taught when I was a probation officer was anger management. Uh, so, you know, if you're ever convicted of domestic violence, uh, the, Lu the Lutenberg Act um, went into act into law in 1997, and it prohibits anybody with even a Class B misdemeanor of domestic violence from possessing a firearm. Okay. Cops who are convicted lose their jobs. And nurses who are convicted of domestic violence lose their license and their job. Possession of a firearm by someone who's been convicted of domestic violence is federal jurisdiction and punishable by up to 10 years in prison. Uh, you just don't want to play with that particular world. So the government is interfered, Inter not interfered, but intervene. You know, should the government be able to intervene? Should the government dictate to us what we can and cannot do? Should we dictate what can happen? So the battered women syndrome uh, was established as a criminal defense in the 1970s. Uh, the first successful case was depicted in the Farrah Fawcett movie called The Burning Bed. Um, you gotta remember that was a 1970s movie, so the technical effects um, aren't that great, but uh, you know, it was a good movie and it shows the battered women women's syndrome and it shows exactly what it is. But the battered women's syndrome is when a woman kills her husband because of the abuse in the house. And with the battered women women's syndrome, the woman has to establish that she's in fear of her life. And that the content she stopped the abuse because she was afraid of being murdered and killed. Um, and in order to prove this, you have to establish the abuse uh, 
that the, has been documented by the police, that you've been calling the police and that you've been trying to you know, protect yourself. You've left and then withdrawn back into the relationship or however that works about. Um, so uh, I think this week we have another another discussion that we have to discuss. Um, let me see. Yes, we have another discussion this week. And that discussion is what cultural values and myths prevent society from understanding why victims stay with their abusive mates. Can these be changed? If so, how? Um, how can it be accomplished? I know Jen's already answered. Um, I liked last week's discussions, um, but you know, there's something that I've always heard. You know, you've made your bed and now you've got to lay in it. And this is a quote that came out of that, that found its way into the movie, The Burning Bed, where Farrah Fawcett's mother, the character Farrah Fawcett plays, she leaves her abusive husband. She goes home with her kids to her mother's house. And then the abusive guy shows up and he's screaming and yelling and pounding on the doors. And mom says, you have to go back. You made this bed. Now you got to live it. You got to lay in it. You're the one that married him. You're the one that chose to have children with him. So now you have to tolerate the abuse and you have to move back. Uh, and... You know, this is what I mentioned you know, 30 minutes ago. You need to make sure that you support the victims of domestic violence when they're trying to get out. Uh, domestic violence victims have been emotionally and psychologically terrorized. Uh, they are not given or allowed to have any control of the money. So they have no economics. They have no finances to escape. Uh, by the time violence does start occurring within a family, uh, the victim of that domestic violence has been conditioned to make her believe that this punishment is deserved, you know, and, and she's going to turn around and it's going to be, well, if I'd only made sure that his supper was ready, if I only made sure that his food was hot when he got home from work, you know, he wouldn't have beat me. You know, if it wasn't for his boss being a pain in the neck and constantly pestering and pestering and pestering, he wouldn't have hit me. He wouldn't have beat me. He wouldn't have caused this. You know, it's my fault because I am not compassionate enough. I am not caring enough. I'm not listening or meeting his needs. So he lashed out violently against me and it's my fault. How do I say this in words that will pass the YouTube censors? Oh, yeah. Bullshit. Have a good day.